Okay, so today I'll go back to the topic we broached on Thursday and Tuesday about science and social issues and should science, uh, one school of thought that says science is science and we should behave like birds, pay no attention to ornithologists and others would say we should pay some attention to the social implications of science and a big one is obviously global warming and it's become extremely polarized to such a degree that Thomas Friedman who is a syndicated columnist in the New York Times, a very influential fellow, would, a while ago he wrote a paper, he was so frustrated with this polarization that he said we should demand, he demanded of people in prestigious institutes to write a 50 page report called What We Know and he insisted this should be readable by children in high school. But he was actually getting sick and tired of the debate about global warming. And the strange thing is that such reports already exist. Uh, Kerry Manuel has one, uh, I don't know, somebody published it. It's a short 50 page thing that tells the essence of global warming. There are several others, uh, Archer at Chicago has a very good report. There are websites. There's no lack of information about global warming. So th this report I submit will not do us much good, what we know. And to find out why, we can ask, so we, he wants an explanation for global warming, the scientific. We can ask people a much simpler question. Uh, why is summer warmer than winter? And to, uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. So this video will go on for just a few minutes. And it's a video in which a group of very highly educated people are asked a very simple story, a very simple question. Uh, uh, I should probably. Oh, the sound is. Uh, hmm? Oh. Where is this mic? Is, uh, is it audible at all? Yeah, yeah. Is there anybody, uh, anybody knows how I can use this to? Hmm? Hmm? Despite a lifetime of a very best education, students in our classrooms are failing to learn science. Many of these students will graduate from college with the same scientific no, it's at maximum. It, it should be possible. Oh. Hmm. Uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, 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 so what we're trying to figure out. Yeah, the, okay, <coughs> this is it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's maximum. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, never mind, I, I can tell you what's impressive about this picture. In, in fact, if you just look at the pictures. I mean, putting the microphone here should work. It, it should work, but I, 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 I did. And, uh, so maybe you put the one for the camera oh, oh. and the one for the room. Okay. Well, no. Let's see the speakers. I'm not sure where they are, but we can try here. Is that any better? No. Put both. Put both of them because we don't know which one is it. Anyway, just watch the pictures and I'll tell you what's going on. Because what's, it, what's impressive here is um, you see highly educated, very wealthy people. Uh, this is Harvard University. They have the most expensive education money can buy. Uh, and they asked this very Despite simple question. Despite a lifetime of the very best education, students in our classrooms are failing to learn science. You, you can't hear. Many anyway, so the voice says that they have extremely good education. They asked why some of this woman in the winter. 
and you see a succession of people with complete self-confidence giving a completely wrong answer. Uh, one of them studied physics, and he mentioned that he studied relativity and electromagnetism and so the on. And most of them uh, proceed, you know, the physicist, uh, he proceeds to explain that the Earth is closer to the sun in summer and further from winter. And it goes on, the next uh, student to come up is a young woman, and uh, she doesn't know either. Afterwards, they told them that they gave the wrong answer, and they then assure the interviewer that it's not really important because they're successful. So it's not really important to know why summer is warmer than winter. And when I'm in Africa, I tend to emphasize that aspect of this video, that a big point of education is simply uh, self-confidence. Uh, but these people don't lack in self-confidence. And so it's not going to affect them. From their perspective, it's actually not important to know why summer is warmer than winter. Uh, you can watch it on your websites some other occasion. This is the very self-confident lady who uh, assures us that... Ah, okay, so that's with the self-confident lady who tells us that it, it doesn't matter if you don't know why summer is warmer than winter, because the... They're going to get good jobs. They're going to get good jobs. And they have a point to make, and, uh, as I said, the main, one of the main points of education is building self-confidence and uh, if you had given those people enough time they would have gone to a library they have the resources and they would have discovered why the summer is warmer than winter so it's not really a main problem it's nonetheless a topic worth investigating and because something has seriously gone wrong uh, if at universities such as harvard people don't know the answer to this question how can we expect them to understand global warming? It's a far more complicated issue. And I would say two things have gone wrong. One, science education has become divorced from our experience, our daily lives. And if those students in the video, it's a bright sunny day in Cambridge, Massachusetts, if they had simply bothered to look up, they would have seen the sky, the sun was right above them, very close to, was shining very brightly. If you ask them where was the sun in winter, they would say well, it was way over there. In other words, the trajectory of the sun changes with the seasons. And uh, yesterday, uh, I think it was Michael who said that people in kindergarten learn that in the southern hemisphere, the seasons are the opposite. So if you bother to put these things together, if you actually start thinking, instead of simply accepting what the authorities tell you, then you would actually start participating. You'd become a scientist. And you would actually understand that the matter of the seasons is a fascinating phenomena and different people in different places have entirely different seasons and so forth. I'm coming back to this later. I'm actually trying to propose to push a big international program to study nothing other than the seasonal cycle, uh, which both for social reasons and scientific reasons is a fascinating problem, but I'll come back to that later. Uh, so you divorce your daily experience from what you learn in class, in classrooms, and you rely on experts, which is what these students do. Uh, so uh, most of us tend to rely on experts for our information. And so we, the, the danger of that becomes apparent if you looked at, at past disputes. And in the past, we've had a debate for 2,000 years about the shape of the Earth. Is it flat or is it round? And the, again, why was it a debate? It's simply because of relying on the opinion of experts. So if you step outside, it's certainly not obvious that the Earth is round. It's, it's much more likely. Most of the Earth is incredibly flat. Uh, it's much more likely you can say that it's flat. Furthermore, it's counter to the scriptures to say that the Earth is uh, round. Uh, nonetheless, the debate was settled. And uh, you could then say people ought to be aware of this because it simply exposes the risk of trusting experts. You yourself ought to get involved. And so I would argue that we don't need reports on just what we know. We also need the reports on how we know what we know. Uh, most people are ignorant of the history of science, but we've debated the shape of the Earth, we've debated the location of the Earth center of the universe. They were incredibly passionate, but poor Galileo ran into lots of trouble. We've, I would go further and say, 
There are books on how we know what we know, that tell us about Galileo and so on, but that still will not be enough. We need even more. We need to point out to people what we cannot know from science. And this brings us to the heart of the global warming problem, that science does not tell us what we should do about global warming, because global warming raises ethical issues. So global warming is entirely different from debates about the shape of the Earth or the location of the Earth. If you accept that the Earth is round, it has no impact on the way you live your life. You can have a more accurate map, all sorts of practical benefits, but in how you should treat the poor or how you should vote in politics, it's not affected. Similarly, the location of the Earth, the Pope got very exercised about it, but the Pope ended up with a better calendar. Uh, it's so you can give up, accept that the Earth is not at the center of the universe. It has no eth ethical implications. Global warming is different. Global warming quickly becomes the issue of uh, uh, how do we determine a balance between our obligations to future generations, we want to leave future generations a better planet, and our obligations to those suffering today. So there are huge numbers of people on the order of billions on this planet who don't know where their next meal is coming from. I would submit that global warming is not an issue to them. Uh, most, to most Africans, global warming is not the issue. So how do we decide? Africans are not irresponsible. They want to leave the planet better than they arrived on it. it it's, there's no easy answer, and we need to acknowledge that. And we could, so a global warming is polarizing because of wrenching ethical dilemmas. Once you've decided you should do something about global warming, there's the matter of to what degree should the government interfere in your life in trying to impose regulations. And uh, in the US at least, this has completely polarized the country. There's one group of people believe that the marketplace will take care of the problem. The government should stay out of the way. Another group feels it's incumbent on the government to act. Again, there's no simple solution to that. So when we deal with polarized situations, uh, we need some guidance. I propose we ask Nelson Mandela. Uh, he inherited a completely polarized country. Everybody expected a civil war. Some like a million people left the country. Most of those were young, highly educated. And uh, it was his job to keep things together. So South Africa has a first world economy that works for 10% of the population. So it was decided you can't just abandon this economy. Uh, had to keep going, you needed peace. The economy is run by white people, like it or not. Uh, they neglect to educate black people. So South Africa is dependent for its economic welfare on not disturbing things too much. So many people are disappointed. Mandela takes over. There's no redistribution of wealth. In fact, there's not even any, you can call it revenge. But what's amazing about Mandela thrown into prison comes out, has the power to take revenge, and declines. It's absolutely, uh, I'm not capable of that. Uh, the, anyway, if you want to see, I recommend a movie called Invictus. And it's quite a bad movie. <laughs> it's about a game called rugby. It's about as boring a game as you can find. I nonetheless recommend you watch the movie, because the movie is actually about symbols, the importance of symbols. And, but Mandela does uh, rugby as a game played by white youth, and it's played with an oblong ball. Uh, blacks in South Africa absolutely detest this game. Whites are fanatical about it. The blacks choose to play with a round ball. So the South African soccer team has no white players, and the South African rugby team has no black players. Uh, it's a symbol of oppression, rugby. So uh, Mandela decides that he should persuade the black population to support this game. There's a big international competition, and the movie tells the story of how he, he himself starts to learn about the game, learn about the players, learn about the strategy. And uh, the whites succeed in winning the game. And it, it's a glorious occasion for the entire country. There's some unity. It was repeated in 2008. Was that the last World Cup? 2010. Anyway, the last soccer World Cup in South Africa, they basically repeated the exercise. Uh, you could ask why should the poor country host such an expensive thing? And I was there for the month, and the country was transformed. Crime is a high problem. For a month, there was no crime. Everybody's attention was focused on this. We can get like this into that on another occasion. The main message from the movie is that uh, uh, Mandela succeeded by democratizing rugby. 
And what we need to do is to democratize science. So science at the moment is elitist, this is activity for experts, jet setters. Uh, they indulge in these extremely rational series of explanations. And the most digression is a book I highly recommend to you. It's called Thinking Slow, Thinking Fast by a psychologist Kahneman. And basically, we all love to think fast, meaning instinctive. Uh, thinking slow, which has developed very recently in human evolution, is the frontal part of your brain, is uh, energy absorbing activity. Once you think, if I ask you what's 2 plus 2, you know the answer is 4. If I ask you what is 243 times 17, you can come up with the answer, but while you come up with it, you have to pay attention strictly to that. You can't multitask. Uh, your They've measured that your eyes dilate, your blood pressure goes up, all sorts of physiological changes. Thinking slowly, thinking rationally, is not an activity we particularly like to indulge in. Most of us like to think fast. And it's for that reason we like to have experts take over for us the slow thinking. It, it, it's an absolutely fascinating book, and I recommend that you uh, read it. So what you have to, what the scientists do at the moment, is uh, science is a rational activity and we think slow. So at this point I was going to show you another video, I'll, I'll refrain. Uh, the video is about a uh, woman, uh, it, it, to me it demonstrates what's wrong with the teaching of science. So at, uh, at the equator in Africa, if you happen to visit, there's a fellow who will demonstrate for you the Coriolis force. And he has a bucket of water, he steps 10, steps 10 yards south of the equator, pulls a plug, the water goes this way. Then it goes north of the equator, the water goes the other way. And then it goes to the equator, this I find quite amazing, and the water goes straight down. And uh, there's all sorts of tourists, wealthy tourists, again, highly educated people, and they have photographs taken with him. Some of the more enterprising African, they call him a professor, uh, has a little form that somebody printed for him, and he fills out for you on such and such a date in Nairobi, you witness the Coriolis Force. And I'm sure there are apartments in London and New York where this is demonstrated, and the, these rich tourists have gone on safari, and here's the evidence they saw the Coriolis Force. What's unusual about this video that I can't show, is it's a BBC reporter, a British woman, who goes and watches this. And it, it's entertaining, and she thoroughly enjoys herself. Now, she starts the video by making an interesting comment. She says she's been waiting since childhood to see this, meaning she's highly educated. She knew about the Coriolis Force since childhood, so this is a very educated woman. She thoroughly enjoys herself watching this. She applauds. Then, she, when it's all over, she thanks the professor. She walks back to the van. She turns to the BBC audience and she says to them, I know this is a load of rubbish, but what can I say? I'm impressed. <laughs> now, this sounds like a completely uh, non-rational statement. How can you be impressed by something that uh, is a hoax? And if you want to know why it's a hoax, again, punch into Google demonstration at the equator or into YouTube. There are literally thousands of little videos of wealthy tourists showing this. Then there are also websites by physicists who denounce this. They demand it be stopped because it's a hoax. And it seems that this BBC woman has captured the essence. Well, I should ask you, what do you make of the statement of hers that she enjoyed herself thoroughly watching this? She knows it's a hoax, but she enjoyed it. Any comments? Do you denounce her? It's a stupid statement. I definitely paid for that certificate and I have it at home. Say it what? I paid for that certificate and I have it at home. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 why, why are you so... It's just amusing obviously. Yeah. Uh, I think so it, it's the same way we enjoy seeing magic. Exactly. That's the point. So I, I would submit that what's gone wrong with our science education <laughs> is that we've taken the magic out of science. Science is about magic. It, it's absolutely astonishing. Uh, even something as simple as the force of gravity is amazing. And we reduce science to a series of logical things that are actually quite boring and difficult to follow. Uh, we should delight in our amazing sciences. And th this is why I feel that uh, th there is one school of thought about global warming, and it says uh, it's all about gloom and doom. 
terrible things are going to happen. And I feel we're going to be much more successful with the public if we tell them they live on an astonishing planet. Oh, if, if he can, the, the video is actually quite entertaining, but anyway, I'll <laughs> okay, no, never mind. Okay, anyway, the, they said, uh, the problem here is that this woman's name is Fiona Foster. Uh, she says, the demonstration is fun, it's performed by a magician to her. And I show you it takes quite a bit of skill to do what this African professor did, especially to get the water to go straight down at the equator is quite tricky. I don't know how he manages that. But the, Science, and so the scientists will object. You go to the science websites devoted to this thing, and they demand that this demonstration be stopped. It's undermining science, it's uh, bad in, for science education in general, and this fellow he should come to an halt. And what this woman Fiona Foster is really telling us, we can't live by bread alone. So you can give a series, I would call bread, a series of logical deductions, this and this and this and therefore this, it takes the magic out of science. Uh, we have to somehow tell, so scientists taught us a series of facts, logical deductions. There's no sense of wonder or awe. It, it's absolutely astonishing place. We deal with amazing things all the time. The, if you again go back to the history of science, something like the force of gravity we take for granted, a force acting at a distance, is an amazing thing, was initially completely rejected. Uh, Newton came up with this idea. It took quite a while to persuade people there's force at a distance. The Coriolis force is even more amazing. There's all sorts of everything we deal with is astonishing, and some of the how we succeed in taking the magic out of it. So I was given an opportunity to we go to South Africa, uh, it was a few years ago, and assist with, there's a big major problem. As I said, a million people left South Africa when apartheid ended. South Africa has huge unemployment, 20-30%, has a huge number of job vacancies. There are no people to fill these vacant positions, complete lack of education. 20 years since apartheid ended, still no black scientists. How do you attract science? How do you attract black youth to science? And so, the, I decided we have to do what Mandela did, you have to democratize science, and you have to make it fun, you have to use it to build self-confidence, and the most, the best vehicle for it is really global warming. And then I ran into serious trouble with my white colleagues, to them global warming is about gloom and doom, it's about the end of the world, and they're going to prepare the government for that. So they're very intent on providing information that in my opinion is completely useless. How you should avoid the problems 50 years from now that may or may not occur. There are problems right now. Why don't you help with the problems now? I'll just give one example. In Cape Town it uh, rains every winter. Completely predictable. Uh, I can then predict that there will be, the, the slums will be flooded, that there will be ads in the newspapers for people to please donate blankets and so on. So here you have the perfect example of a climate change, completely predictable, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> Why didn't you do something about it? Instead you worry about climate change that may or may not occur 50 years from now and advocate all sorts of policies that would actually increase poverty. So the thing about science, th these workshops proved quite successful and I would say the essence of science is questions. You have to ask questions and in Cape Town, in every place, there's something quite special and I can come to. We can have a discussion of what's very special about Guanajuato. I assure you, it is an amazing place. I happen to be in Cape Town. The amazing thing in Cape Town is that it has one of the world's six plant kingdoms. And, and there's a very tiny area. So there must be something quite astonishing. So Cape Town has this enormous diversity of climatic zones. And if you want to imagine what Cape Town is like, imagine Miami as a place on the east coast of the US. It's perfectly flat, it's verdurous, it's next to a warm ocean. And then you go about the same latitude to the west, you get to Ensenada or to San Diego. Uh, it's next to a cold ocean, you need a bodysuit to go to the beach. It's arid, there's almost no rain, there are mountains. So you can't imagine two more different places than Miami and say San Diego. Now suppose you deform the North American continent and you put Miami next to San Diego, the result would be Cape Town. You'd have an enormous diversity of climatic zones. Cape Town is the only city on the planet where you have a choice between a warm beach and a cold beach. If you go to the Atlantic side, 
And I, I can show you some pictures. You go to the Atlantic beaches, everybody is on the sand, nobody's in the water. You go to the Indian Ocean beach, which is 20 minutes away, everybody's in the water and nobody's on the sand. In the one place the water is too cold, in the other way. The other place you have to worry about sharks, that's another story. Uh, so that, that's a picture of Cape Town and uh, I think it's... Th there's some quote I had from some early explorer. Uh, that's the same mountain seen from the side, you, you fly around, and the one side is the Atlantic, the other side, way back there is the Indian Ocean. If you wonder what these plants look like, you, that's them. And what we then did is organize this Hubble Planet workshop was to tell people why Cape Town is special, why is it so, and assure them they're very lucky to be there. And it's a wonderful vehicle for teaching science. So you go up the mountain, it, it, it's not a particularly serious talk, the mountain is a kilometer high, thousand meters, and you go with balloons and thermometers, and you have introduction to adiabatic lapse rate and all sorts of things. And the key thing was for me to stay out of the picture. So any authority figure, anybody with gray hair, uh, has to be in the background, and I got the students to teach graduate students, postdocs, to do the teaching. And so they go up, there they're coming down the mountain, uh, there they're playing on the beach. Okay, and the biggest compliment I had was from a professor at one of the black universities. South Africa is by and large still segregated, there are a number of black universities that are decidedly disadvantaged, almost no teachers with qualifications. And th th one of the faculty members has told me that he knew which of his students, he got to tell, had been to the workshop. It was the students who asked questions. Okay, so the whole point of apartheid was to tell people that they shouldn't bother, I'll tell you what you need to know, you're going to work at a mine, you don't need to know mathematics, so on. Completely destroyed or tried to destroy self-confidence. Uh, so the key point here is simply to A, tell them they're lucky to be where they are. They're in an exceptional place. Be positive about it. Uh, secondly, this place, science can become fun. Right? Uh, and you can, there's opportunity to ask questions. The scientific mode of instruction as such, is, even at Princeton, uh, the other university, I think Eli had a wonderful story to tell about the student at Harvard University who told him when she was undergraduate, she thought the professors were these incredibly clever people. They devote their lives to uh, teaching innocent young undergraduates when they could be doing lots of other things, making lots of money. And then this girl became a graduate student. She came to see him again and she, she's now changed her mind. She decided that professors are professors because that's all they can do. <laughs> they, they're not capable of doing anything else. And so professors have this peculiar position in society and it, it's not particularly favorable one i feel we should almost stay out of the way that we should leave it to the youth to teach the youth uh, uh, questioning is much more uh, much easier for somebody your age in south africa it has the additional problem it, it, it's it, but it is pretty much so well and alive you give me somebody's address i can tell you what race they are these workshops serve to bring them together. And so they would, for the first time, meet people with different opinions. Uh, lo and behold, they would meet people of different colors. And they discovered that they have lots in common. The, and this does enormously well for, for self-confidence. The upshot of this, so I'm going to go back to the demonstration at the equator. And the reason it fascinates me is that the demonstration at the equator poses two questions and they're entirely parallel to the two key questions in global warming. The one question, is this demonstration a hoax? Okay, so you can go and you can perform it and you can try, it's actually very difficult to do what, the, what this demonstrator does. And your conclusion, most of the people who then fail conclude that they are poor experimentalists that you need the special touch of this demonstrator. Uh, so it, it's not so easy to demonstrate this a hoax. And many people, I, I once spoke to a tourist there, and he told me he was from Michigan, that he'd been told in Michigan that about this demonstration to go and watch it because it's a hoax. But now that he's seen it, he's not so sure. 
<laughs> it was entirely, so it's not all that easy to demonstrate this, this demonstration as a hoax, but it is. And I assume this is a highly educated audience, you will know why it is a hoax. We won't go into that, but it, it's quite an intricate argument. Uh, the second thing, entirely separate question, is should the demonstration be stopped? So I can ask you, the physicists on the web demand that this be stopped for the reason that it's undermining their efforts to teach science. And uh, who is at fault? Something has gone wrong here with this demonstration. So I would argue that the only person who's actually innocent here is the African. The African demonstrator, uh, to him, this is a strange ritual. White people show up, they like to see the water go this way, this way, and then they give him tips. If he makes a mistake and goes the same way, he won't get a tip. So this is some ritual that they're obsessed with, and people like Eli would like certificates to show they've seen it. Uh, they don't actually understand the thing. All they know is this is what people would like to see. The people, the tourists who are misled, uh, should be applauded for getting interested. The, the laymen are genuinely interested in science. They can get interested in something as boring as water going this way and that way. So the real culprits are the physicists, are the teachers, it, it's us. We do absolutely terrible science. All the African is doing, he's the messenger. He puts a test to the students. All these people have taken courses in poetry, what's it, physics for poets. They've learned about the Coriolis force, they completely misunderstood it. And so now the physicists want to shoot the messenger. Okay, so the, the problem here is quite similar to the problem with the Pope and Galileo. Okay, so uh, Galileo has a scientific truth, and the question is what's more important, scientific truth or the welfare of the Catholic Church? And the Pope decides to shut up Galileo. The, the Pope was having a lot of trouble with Martin Luther and the like. He couldn't afford to have one of his own shut him up. So the second question is far, far more difficult than the first one. And the main thing is that the scientists are completely wrong in demanding that this demonstration be stopped. Now, there's an easy way to actually modify the demonstration so that it suddenly becomes a powerful vehicle for teaching science. And I'll leave that for the discussion. So how would you, what, what would you do about this demonstration is basically my challenge to you. It can be modified in such a way that it becomes a powerful tool for teaching science. So uh, I would argue, you still have to read up against the ceiling. On the left, the demonstration of the equator poses two questions. And I'll submit that exactly the same similar questions are posed by global warming. Uh, global warming tells you uh, how does CO2 affect climate. Uh, is the answer to that? Uh, when the, there are people, the governor of Texas says it's a hoax, all sorts of congressmen, whatever. Uh, is it a hoax or not? We have an unambiguous answer to that. We can establish it objectively. Then what should we do about this? This is, it does not have an easy, easy answer. And so my proposal, at least to the Africans, is to use um, global warming to, as an educational tool. And so th these workshops I've started, the early success I've had, so the, the irony is, South Africa tracked me back and offered me a fancy research position and expected me to behave as if I were a Princeton professor. And if I wanted to be a Princeton professor, I would stay in Princeton. I, I didn't think South Africa needs Princeton professors. South Africa needs something else. They need somebody, some people to help them democratize science, basically. And so what i proposing to South Africans, and I've become quite skeptical of big international programs. Uh, and to me, it's a form of colonialism from a third world perspective. Programs such as IPCC or WOS or CLIBAR or whatever. The, the, the rich go there, I'll, I'll just tell one story. I went to a workshop where, called by IPCC, and uh, the purpose of the workshop was to d determine how Africa can best be assisted to deal with global warming. And to get to the the workshop itself was in a fancy conference center such as this. We stayed in a fancy hotel. But to get from the hotel to the conference center, you go past slums. And uh, we did this three, four days in a row. At the end of that four days, the recommendations were written up. And the recommendation was that uh, <coughs> what Africa needs is a big supercomputer with the output of climate models. 
I, mean, I couldn't imagine. These people must have been blind. They, they, they simply they arrived in Africa with this recommendation in mind. Nothing they saw there changed their opinion. They're simply blind. And I find this repeatedly. Lots of countries trying to help Africa are convinced that what Africa needs is what they have to offer. <laughs> they, there's simply no concept, no attempt to identify with what is actually what the place needs. The, as I said, this was a, my experience in South Africa that made me aware. And, and there's lots of incidents, so I'll just conclude with one. In India, in the late 1800s and most of the 1900s, there were severe famines that literally killed millions of people. And the uh, famines were a consequence of failure of the monsoons. And so England sent them best, uh, at Cambridge University, the best mathematician gets some award. In 1899, there was a fellow called Sir Gilbert Walker. He was at Sir at the time. He won that award. He was promptly sent to India and asked to predict the monsoons. And Gilbert did wonderful work, including work on the Southern Oscillation and so forth. Uh, what Gilbert did not succeed in doing is predicting the monsoons. It's 100 years later, monsoons is a difficult problem, we still cannot predict it. However, there are no longer famines, not on the scale of uh, the ones uh, earlier in the 1900s. So you can ask how did India solve this problem of famines? And it's gonna, we can have a debate about it, but the short of it was that India became independent of England. Uh, once the Indians were uh, faced with the task of solving their own problems rather than depending on the British to try to solve the problems for them, they did extremely well. And so the, the whole point is we have to build things in these countries rather than go with advice. And uh, I would submit that what Africans suffer from is, is excess of advice and a lack of opportunities. Uh, everybody has advice what they should be doing. Uh, instead, what we should try to do. And so I want to invite you. What I have in mind is the, we, we internationally, I feel, we lack an interesting big scientific problem. Uh, the global warming is a big one. We're highly organized to do this. Uh, we're doing it poorly, in my opinion. Uh, it's too highly organized. It's too big science. We need small science. And I don't see much, I don't see sufficient opportunity for that. So I'm trying to persuade the South African government to announce a big project, say a five-year project, to study the seasonal cycle. And they're in the ideal location. It's a huge climate signal. Uh, look at all the things that's happening. So you have a big diversity of climatic zones in Africa. It's surrounded by three entirely different oceans. And the west one is very cold off Africa. The east one is warm, the Indian Ocean. South is where much of the CO2 that the ocean that goes out of the atmosphere, the ocean absorbs it there. We actually understand all of this very poorly. It all has huge seasonal cycles. The seasonal cycle is an appealing topic because it is an enormous climate signal. Everybody's familiar with it, layman can understand it. Scientifically, there are actually many aspects of it we still don't understand. Uh, you could get children in classrooms, give them a thermometer, let them measure after 30 hey, days. Uh, habitable planet workshops. I call them habitable planet workshops. The, the, basically, the goal is to explain why the planet is habitable, why we're so lucky to be here. What intrigues me is that the reason these workshops succeeded was people meeting other people very different from themselves, having exchanges. Uh, seasonal cycles are amazingly different, even in South Africa, from place to place. There are places where it rains in winter, there are places where it rains in summer, and there are places where it rains throughout the year. And so imagine by Skype you can put them in contact, give the children thermometers, let them monitor. After 30 days you can introduce them to graphs, to statistics, you can tell them about variance. You can introduce science in a painless manner. And the people, what we need, I also want to introduce a one-year master's diploma. And the goal is not to have more earth scientists. The goal is just to have educated workforce for the country. But I say so you can use this as a vehicle to do that. Uh, we need postdocs. And so what I, I spoke to some postdocs at Princeton. Princeton introduced something called a teaching postdoc, where instead of two years working strictly on some research, you spend three years. And one semester each year you spend uh, teaching. 
developing a course or participating or whatever. And so I, I've spoken to the ones there, would you like to go to some obscure African place for a semester with three or four other postdocs, uh, jointly teach courses. This has to be coordinated centrally, obviously. So I want to conclude by inviting, potentially all of you will be postdocs, if you're interested in going to some exotic African place for a semester, a year, semesters, 10 weeks, for two or three years, let me know. Thank you very much. <laughs>